Hi, this is Kurt Eggebrecht, Health Officer for the City of Appleton, and we really appreciate the questions you've been sending. Today's focus will look at schools and school reopenings and how it impacts families in our area. Since schools closed at last spring, we've been working very closely with the public schools and private schools here in Appleton to look at how would we learn from that experience where we had virtual learning and, and how do we minimize uh, transmission of viruses in the school setting where we are to reopen. So with those conversations, we have uh, shared a lot about how the virus is transmitted and the safest uh, strategy still is to avoid uh, exposure to the virus. So that would be the virtual learning option that schools are providing. Another option they're looking at is hybrid, which is where you might have one or two days a class a week, and then three days where you have virtual learning to augment that face-to-face -face encounter. The whole idea behind that strategy is to minimize the risk of exposure to anyone who would be positive and, and not have any signs and symptoms of illness within the school setting. So you're, you're limiting the time of exposure. And then the third model that they've been looking at is 100% uh, in classroom as if the virus was no longer here. And that would be an option when we had very low transmission within our community. Yeah, as we've said in the past, we're, we're learning new information every week on this novel virus. And one of the things that we've been able to learn is that children seem to have uh, fewer adverse outcomes in terms of hospitalizations and complications from the disease. With that said, it is a new virus and we don't know the full extent of what uh, contracting the virus is for children. We know that children 10 and older tend to have more hospitalization and physician visits than under 10 years of age. But we're also aware that we've really been protective of youth in general. And we really, since school years were closed last spring, we really haven't had an opportunity to bring the very young children together in a setting that would allow for frequent transmission to occur. So we're learning as we're going. And a recent study just came out this week from Morbidity Mortality that looked at a youth camp that occurred in the state of Georgia. And what they found uh, for the children that had an overnight and stayed extended periods of time together is they did have significant uh, transmission within that age group. So I think it, it's one of those situations where we're gonna learn more and learn more when schools begin. As we just discussed, there are certain groups of people that are at greater risk, and we know people as they age, especially over the age 60, have a higher degree of incidence of adverse outcomes. So people in their 90s have a greater risk than people in their 80s, and people in their 80s have a greater risk than people in their 70s. But as a rule, we know people over the age of 60 seem to have more outcomes, uh, adverse outcomes related to COVID. So as we're getting ready for school and you're thinking about childcare uh, in your family household and those that care for your child when you're not able, are, do they fit in any of those categories? Are they over age 60 and or do they have any underlying health conditions? Just as we're learning age is a factor, we're learning for all age groups, obesity tends to be a factor, for example. So if you're unclear about uh, your BMI, you can go on the CDC website and just put your height and weight in and you determine your, your BMI. And so BMI is over 30 uh, and especially those over 40 tend to be a risk factor for all age groups. Uh, also, we're seeing other chronic health conditions like diabetes, hypertension, asthma. Those are uh, conditions that also seem to be increasing the risk for people along with the, with the much longer list that's again is available on that CDC website. we know this virus needs a human host to transfer it to another person. So just as with work settings, uh, the same holds true in the school setting, that, that social distancing is still our best defense, followed closely by wearing a face covering and frequent hand washing. The more we can do those three activities, we're going to be minimizing the transmission opportunity from this virus. Yeah, as we learn more about the virus, uh, we are learning through science that in addition to the virus clinging to large moisture droplets from our breath that we've talked about before, 
we're finding that they also can be suspended in there in the form of aerosols uh, for periods of time. So what that means in the classroom setting is that if you're in a uh, indoor airspace for an extended period of time, say six, eight hours a day, uh, and someone was contagious and infectious at the time, those uh, particles might be able to be aerosolized and uh, suspended in the air where others then would, would breathe it into their, their nose or lungs. And that's, that is a concern in all indoor air spaces. Uh, people who are asymptomatic, whether a child or an adult, uh, they can still have a viral load and, and spread that to other people, even though they're not symptomatic. And that's really what's going on in our community with the community spread. People are often not feeling ill, uh, and yet their body is shedding the virus uh, and that's how it's transmitted from one person to the next. Yeah, what we've learned is that the existing chemicals that have been used in the school setting for years is very effective on COVID-19. So it's unlikely there'll be a new product that's introduced as a result. Uh, there may be more frequent uh, cleaning, especially in high touch areas within the school building. Uh, but in terms of new chemicals being introduced, I'm not aware of any that the school districts are using. A lot of research has gone into this actually, and what we're learning is that screen time is important uh, for, for multiple reasons, one of which is it takes away from physical activity time. However, we also know that there's not all screen time is equal. So if a child is in the education session, uh, they may be in a very calm environment, a learning environment, versus if they're in an environment where they're gaming and the adrenaline rush of a game that they're playing uh, for an extended period of time, that could have a very different uh, outcome on, on their uh, perception of that, that screen time in a week. So what we're learning is that educational uh, extension of time on, on screen time doesn't seem to pose a health risk, as long as it's balanced with uh, ample opportunity for physical activity. Yeah, this is going to be true with any communicable disease that we work in a school setting. So it could be pertussis or it could be COVID-19. What we'll do is once we have a lab confirmed case, whether that's in a student or faculty member, we'll do an investigation as to who else may have been in contact for sufficient periods of time that would make them suspected of needing to be in quarantine. And that likely would be perhaps the entire classroom. Uh, and then they would be quarantined for 14 days uh, before returning to school. We would first do that in pods of the students and faculty that were with each other. And then we would ask additional questions. Were they in a religious class? Were they in extracurriculars where they were exposed to another group of students? And from that investigation, we then outreach to do the contact investigation and make sure that those people again are quarantined for a period of time of 14 days so that that disease doesn't uh, uh, take hold in yet another person that may or may not be feeling ill and yet being able to shed it and spread it to others. So that, that work doesn't change uh, whether it's COVID-19 or another uh, disease within our school setting. Yeah, so I think the, the, what's important in that question is how do parents plan for this? And so if they have made a decision to have their student uh, go in person for education this fall, and then a classmate of their, their student uh, becomes ill and their child now needs to be quarantined, uh, that could replay itself for a couple times within the school year. So parents do need to think about uh, if my student is quarantined, who will be doing the uh, uh, supervision of that child during that time. Does that require me then to leave from work or do I have a backup plan to do that? And then secondarily, what if my child does become ill? How does that impact my family now that they would have to be quarantined? So thinking ahead about needing two weeks of food supply, for example, or medicines or other supplies is, is something that families will want to do as they develop their back to school plans. Yeah, I think once a vaccine that's safe and effective and we have enough people in our community that, that choose to get the vaccine, that's important to develop what's known as herd immunity, where you have the majority of the people that are protected so that if the virus were going from one person to the next, they have a defense against contracting it. 
And that's really where the end game will be and when we can bring closure to this, to this current pandemic. I think, I think there's a guidance that the state has produced that looks at, at two indicators locally. One is the trajectory. In other words, are your case counts going up? Are they staying the same or are they, or are they becoming lower? And so that is a kind of your trend analysis. Secondly, we look at burden and that's the number of cases per 100,000 people. And based on that, Appleton along with the majority of the state right now is at a very high level. And, and so that is one of the triggers that we would look at. The other important piece though, and we talked about it earlier, is a scenario where there aren't enough reagents or supplies to do ample testing. And so if you have a situation where uh, you don't really know your number of cases because you can't do the testing of people who are symptomatic, uh, that would be uh, difficult to, to say with certainty that we're either at a high, moderate, or low because you wouldn't have a high degree of, of accuracy to predict that.